The Galaxy S24 Ultra has had a controversial launch. Oh my god, AI? That's amazing. Wait, did they just make the cameras worse? Seven years of software support, are you kidding? This chipset is a thermal nightmare. I have been seeing it, I have been reading it, while I have also been testing it. This is my definitive review of Samsung's flagship phone of the year, the S24 Ultra, and also whether or not I'm going to be permanently replacing my iPhone for it. So let's start with the outside. Even though Samsung swapped out their phone's frame from aluminium to titanium, and even though they've now got this brand new four times stronger than the competition glass, this phone is still not difficult to damage. I've got a whole load of small scuffs over the sides, and they expose the fact that this matte texture you see here is only a very thin layer. Wherever it's scratched, it becomes glossy, making it immediately obvious, and the screen is still wearing and tearing just like every other phone. Now maybe this glass is stronger, and maybe if the exact same things that had happened to this had also happened to other phones, they might be worse off. But the point is, I have been very careful with this phone. I've not dropped it, I've not tried to damage it, so basically it's not some sort of miracle glass that's going to solve your durability problems, like Samsung might want you to believe. i tell you what would though, if the company still pre-installed your screen protector like they used to. Now that said, this design overall, I actually like it even more as time's gone on. Every time I pick the thing up, I do think, whoa, this is such a pretty phone. The texture feels great. Those even screen borders, very aesthetically pleasing. And I'm even coming around to the flat screen. Since the way that Samsung's curved the body of the phone, it doesn't have the problems that normally come with flat screens. But actually, low-key, the biggest upgrade to the screen, which Samsung has done an awesome job of implementing, but an awful job at communicating, is this reduction to screen glare. The S24 Ultra almost completely kills incoming reflections, which is something we've seen some phone screens do a little better than others over the years, but this is the biggest standout that I can remember. And as soon as you experience it once, it becomes instantly clear that this is the obvious next logical step up for all screens. Because, I mean, companies have spent so many years trying to make their screens more color accurate, trying to make them brighter, trying to make them more contrasty, and now you cannot just get that experience, but you can actually retain that experience. Irrespective of whether you're sitting next to a window or whether there's bright sunlight casting over you, it makes this my favorite screen on a phone, full stop. So the outside of the phone is A+. But it's living with the software that I assumed would be the difficult part for me. You know, when I permanently made the jump from Samsung to iPhone three and a half years ago, the reason I did it was all these little things. Little things that build up into what felt like a bigger thing that it didn't seem like would ever be fixed because they're little things. Like voice notes, they used to sound so muffled that it was like I was trying to have a conversation with someone while wearing three face masks on top of each other. Animations, which sounds like a really silly thing, but I was getting tired of phones that kept bragging about how bleeding edge their processors were, but that still didn't feel fluid. And Instagram stories. I kept thinking to myself, what is the point having the best set of cameras if the moment I try to share the content from them, it just gets compressed beyond belief? It's this kind of stuff, and I honestly came into the S24 Ultra expecting none of it to have changed. I was wrong. For one, voice notes, they sound crystal clear now. Drisha has begrudgingly confirmed to me that even though she likes the idea of me using an iPhone, that this does, sadly, sound just as good as the 15 Pro Max. The fluidity of the phone has gone up multiple levels. In a lot of ways, this actually feels smoother to use than my iPhone 15 Pro Max. Like, you can really tell with this new One UI software that Samsung has gone all in on the little things. Like the scrolling acceleration to make things feel truly like they are gliding underneath your fingertips. And the way the apps open and close now, it is consistent, continuously smooth animations. And it's not just that it feels quick, it looks nice too. I was never a massive fan of Samsung's theming, but in just a couple of generations, they've gone a long way to completely flipping that narrative. This is the first Samsung phone that I would say is right out of the box, gorgeous. You know the quick panel, the way it's organized, the rounded corners, the precise even spacing between every section, like, yes, finally. The lock screen and the fact that you can now add widgets, you can change up the style, you can scale your clock to the exact size you want to not have to conform to some arbitrary predefined options. The fact that it gives you enough flexibility that you can very much make it yours, while also building in enough structure that it's easy, it's not overwhelming, and whatever you do, it's going to look good. And also the new dark mode running through the phone it's not actually black anymore. It's a sort of dark gray, which is one of those things that for me instantly made the whole phone look a lot better, but I couldn't immediately place my finger on why. I'm sure there will be people who don't like it, but to me, there's something really pleasant about not feeling like you're in ultra high contrast mode all the time. It feels less straining. Now, there are problems with this software, I'm getting to them, but my prevailing feeling is that there's a lot to like. 
For example, when you're on a video call, you just swipe down here and you've got video effects and microphone effects. It actually works in a very similar way to the iPhone, but it has a lot of options. Like you just tap here, it instantly blurs the background. Very cinematic. You can have a colored background, you can pick an image for your background, and you can also even adjust the smoothness of your face. And because it works on a core software level, it can persist across whatever app that you're calling on. The haptics are awesome. Like typing has never felt better on any phone. And while some past Samsungs used to have this tiny bit of lag every now and again while typing, it seems to have been ironed out. You've got the whole good lock suite of customization tools, which is kind of the opposite of what I was saying for the lock screen. This is where you go deep. Like since this is Samsung's first titanium phone, I decided to use good lock to kit mine with a titanium style animated volume rocker. It's just fun. Oh, and then the icing on the cake is seven years of OS updates. Considering that just a few years ago, the industry standard was two to three, that is an absolutely insane promise. And even if you're not going to use your phone for seven years, you still benefit because when you come around to selling it, if your phone is still being supported, it's likely going to retain more of its value. But you saw this coming. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. As well as all the upgrades, there are quite a few things that have felt like a downgrade coming from the 15 Pro Max. Like Instagram and Snapchat stories. They looked subpar before, they still look pretty subpar. It's not really photos that are the issue, it's just the videos. It's like 50% of the processing and the stabilization that makes the cameras good disappears. You can kind of get around it by recording in your native camera app and switching to 1080p instead of 4K to avoid being hit with Instagram compression, but that definitely feels clunky. Samsung's face scanner. I mean, they've tried. Like, they give you an option to add an alternate appearance if, say, sometimes you wear glasses, sometimes you don't. Or you can set your screen to brighten when scanning at night so that this front camera can actually see you. But night is like the one time that you don't want to be blasted by light. And in most middle lighting conditions, it's fine, but it's just slow. It's actually quite surprising to me that such a big company with such successful products still has such a gaping hole. Because there's no doubt that face scanning is definitely the more automatic alternative to fingerprint scanning. It's the future. But until Samsung adds in some sort of infrared 3D scanning tech like the iPhone, you're not really going to want to use this for much. And there's a few more things. The audio quality is not quite as good as the iPhone. It's a tiny bit less loud and a tiny bit less full. Not having MagSafe is actually a massive downgrade, since being able to charge wirelessly while still being able to have your phone propped up so that you can see the screen is very useful to me. <laughs> Samsung software, while very pretty, is definitely a little more aggressive than it used to be, in an annoying way. Now more than ever, it really pushes you towards Samsung services, like Samsung Pass to store your passwords. So eventually you just get fed up of it, so you click OK. But then it's like, oh, you need to download the latest version of Pass. So you download it, and then it's like, oh, you need to set up Pass. And I'm like, go away, I'm just trying to play a game of balloons. The company knows that the best way to lock users in as long-term Samsungers is to get them using as many Samsung services as possible, and you definitely feel it getting shoved down your throat a bit. And then the last gripe, which is a little alarming, Signal. I seem to spend all my time with this phone on either two to three bars while I'm outside, and then literally zero to one when I'm inside. And we did actually have a storm last week and my Wi-Fi went, so I was hotspotting from this. I was barely getting anything speed-wise. Now that is serious, if there's actually a persistent issue, but signal is one of those very subjective things. Everyone has a slightly different signal experience. Mine's been bad, but it's totally worth checking out some other reviews too to see if it is a trend or if I just got particular particularly unlucky. The high-level takeaway for software should still be the fact that Samsung has improved a lot, to the point where this might just be now my favorite Android skin. We'll get to the Galaxy AI stuff in a minute, because I have thoughts, but I want to touch on cameras, because it's been a bit of a hotly debated topic. As you might have seen in my camera comparison, the S24 Ultra's cameras are a pretty big improvement to the S23 Ultra's, but just not in the way that we've come to expect. We're pretty used to each year phones getting a bit more detailed, getting a bit better in low light, zooming a bit further. Samsung's not really done much of that at all. And that's a little sad. I feel like the purpose of an ultra phone should be to break new ground, to be a spectacle, and to showcase the most cutting edge tech that the company has to offer. Whereas this time around, I'm not pulling it out excitedly on the street to just see what it can do, and I don't get that brand new toy to play with feeling, because its output is quite similar to last time. But two things. One, 
that doesn't mean it's a bad camera. It's building on what was already a very strong foundation. And two, what they have done this time as part of this massive software overhaul is made the camera nicer to use. It looks better, it's organized better, the animations are smoother, and it captures faster. Oh, and the screen is so bright that you will never ever have a problem seeing what you're shooting again. Do I wish they'd also improve the output with a brand new 400 megapixel main sensor? Yeah, of course. But was this a much needed improvement nonetheless? And has the company made enough improvements in other parts of the phone for me to forgive them? Also yes. And the editing. The editor on this phone is one of the things that constantly reminds me that we're working with powerful technology. You can do something as obtuse as taking a photo of another photo, Yes, this is me. The phone will understand that photo and still be able to instantly apply the portrait mode effect to make it feel like it is popping out of your screen. And these instant effects have actually ended up being a much bigger deal to me than what Samsung is touting as the key new thing, the generative image editor. While that one obviously is the cooler feature, the better party trick, it's actually very rarely after I've taken a shot do I think to myself, yeah, it would actually be great if this person was here instead of here. I'm glad it exists and I'm curious to see how it evolves, but there is something that does feel a little inauthentic about it. Like it's different to normal photo editing where you feel like you can still be proud of a photo that you took. Here it's it's almost bordering on digital art, which is cool, but it's not as rewarding in a way. Plus the feature is still a bit of effort to use. If it was as simple as you're just browsing in your gallery, you see a person, you pick them up and you move them and then that's it. I probably use it quite a lot to make subtle adjustments to things that aren't quite right. But as it is, where it's like you hit the editor, then you hit the generative editor, you do your tweaks, you confirm your tweaks, you wait for about 10 seconds and then you hit done, it's still a bit long considering that in a big day out you might take 30 photos, you're not gonna do that 30 times. And that is actually a pretty good segue into Galaxy AI in general. What I've been really trying to work out over the last few weeks is, are these AI features actually groundbreaking? or are they just gimmicks? I'll start with the good news. All of this instant translation stuff, that actually has me buzzing. I've never mentioned this before, but part of my extended family is Italian. And I mean like proper Italian. So it's often not the easiest to communicate, but check this out. This is what I do now. When I enter the chat, it already knows that I'm wanting to talk in Italian. So it's got the Italian translator preloaded. I type my message into that translator, wait a couple of seconds, and then the translated text appears in my WhatsApp chat window, ready to hit send. And the fact that it is just set it and forget it. The fact that it knows in which chats you want the translation and in which chats you don't. The fact that it works across all your different messaging apps like SMS, WhatsApp, Instagram is absolutely amazing. It means you're going to talk more with people you otherwise might not, it means you're going to be able to express yourselves better. And also, people like being talked to in their own language. It's funny actually, my sister-in-law was so taken aback by my sudden Italian fluency, she genuinely thought someone had hacked my phone and called my mum to check. Now it isn't perfect, the translation isn't instant, and Samsung's quality of translation is definitely not as good as Google's. Like if I type in, is this Italian working BTW? Samsung gets very confused, whereas Google understands that BTW means by the way, and then makes the translation accordingly, and can also better understand if something is a question, even if you've not explicitly added a question mark. And you are still going to run into dialect problems. Current translation tools are good for simple requests, but actually trying to have a conversational tone is still not quite possible because a lot of things don't translate literally. But as a first stab, this is pretty awesome. Because Samsung has now set the precedent for what one day absolutely will be a game changer. The other thing that's been surprisingly useful is the AI summarization features. Like, while I'm on Android, I've always been a Google Chrome user. I'm now actively choosing to use the Samsung browser because of the summaries. I don't use it all the time, but let's say you hop onto a forum discussion post. This AI can actually read everything that every single person has written and then give you a 30 second summary of all the key opinions. And that same AI technology also helps helps you out with your notes. I've mentioned this before, but my notes used to be a big ol' mess. Because of the chaotic nature of thoughts, and my notes being the way that I keep track of those thoughts, they're the one part of my digital life that's had no trace of organization. But this phone changes that. For starters, while every note would normally be whatever grammar my keyboard spits out in the moment, the AI grammar checker here actually makes those notes feel like way more composed, deliberate thoughts, which then in turn makes you want to look after them and organize them. The way it formats your notes too. Like if I'm writing a list of holiday destinations, the thing will actually categorize them based on continent, which is exactly how I would have done it, but it just would have taken me like 
10 times as long. And then to finish the whole thing off, the phone even generates AI powered covers for your notes, which kind of packages each one into what feels like its own distinct novel almost. It'll even go through and read through the handwritten writing on those notes for info about what to title the note. Now, I do think the phone should just do this automatically as opposed to you having to click generate, but still, compare this to my iPhone notes library, there is a world of difference. And on that note, yes, there is still an S Pen inside of this phone. And for me, it's one of those things that I completely forget it exists 99% of the time, and some part of me wishes Samsung had just swapped it out for an even bigger battery, until the 1% of times where I really need it, and I count my lucky stars that it's right there in front of me. There's something that feels very freeform about writing as opposed to typing, which is why whenever I'm ideating, I'll always use my Remarkable tablet. But do you know what? This has kind of absorbed the functionality of that too. Being able to just whip this S Pen out and write, even when my phone's locked so I'm not getting distracted. It pretty much ticks the same box. My only complaint is that I really feel like it should be on this side, given that I imagine most people are gonna be writing with their right hands and so would want to take it out from here. I imagine the reason they've done this is the cameras now take up a little bit too much space to put it on that side, but Samsung didn't want to move the cameras because that's become their branding. All right, so then we've got Circle to Search, which is basically hold the bottom part of your screen and you enter this new mode. This mode where you can take whatever's on your screen, zoom in, zoom out, move around, and when you're ready, circle something and Google will tell you what it is. And for the first five days of using this phone, I actually completely forgot this feature existed because you know your default is to use your phone the way you already know how to use your phone. Circle to Search requires a very conscious shift in how you think about searching, but when it clicked for me, it clicked hard. This feature is absolutely incredible. You see a photo of a cool product and you wanna know what it is? Circle. You see a photo of a phone you don't recognize? Circle. You wanna rebuy whatever flowers are in the house? Circle to find out exactly what they are. You see a photo of the most beautiful hotel view? Circle it to find out exactly which hotel it is. And I am continuously surprised at how accurate it is. It's very easy for a feature like this to just be a gimmick. This is actually based on something Google made years ago called Now on Tap, where you hold down your home button and your phone tells you exactly what's on your screen. It was a gimmick then, but the seamlessness, how it doesn't exit the app you're currently in, meaning you can find out what you want to find out and with one swipe be back where you were, the fluidity, how you can circle, you can scribble, you can just tap, and the phone always seems to get what you're trying to highlight. And then the intelligence of the results makes this, I'm going to say, game changer category. Like just yesterday, this is going to sound like one of the most first world situations ever. We got this snack in my kitchen on the opposite side to where I was sitting. I just remembered we were running out of that snack and I wanted to top up, but I couldn't remember what they were called. So, pulled out my Samsung, zoomed all the way into that snack, entered Circle to Search, and within about five seconds, that exact product was in my Amazon basket. Now, obviously, that's a dumb example, but I think it kind of illustrates how Circle to Search almost opens the floodgates to what becomes searchable. It makes your phone genuinely feel like your own personal, interactive interface with the world. And now picking up my iPhone, which doesn't have it, it feels old school. And then the final AI feature that I like is the instant slow-mo. It's a top tier idea with good execution. It just needs a bit of polish. Sometimes when you use it, the video will either lag at the start till the phone catches up or create weird artifacts as it's not quite able to insert the perfect in-between frames when slowing videos down. Okay, all that said, there is some stuff that I don't like. Like the live call translation, which is significantly worse than the text message translation. Basically because it's the same thing, but all of a sudden has to happen in real time. To be clear, I'm really glad Samsung's made this. It just needs to get better. Let me give you an example. I'm trying to decide between pineapple on pizza and pineapple on pasta. Which do you think I should go for? I think you should go to jail. <laughs> Oh yeah, and uh, if you're enjoying this video, then a sub to the channel would be... Jeans waits a moment. Ah oh, yes, jeans. <laughs> you could just use my mom, maybe. What? <laughs> no, no, that's that's not what you were trying to say, right? So do you have a sub to the channel word? Fantastic, wonderful, the best YouTube channel. Yes! 
<laughs> we got there. However, there's also some more general caveats worth bearing in mind for all of this AI stuff. One, that a lot of Samsung's AI is actually based on Google tech. And so even some of the things that Samsung made seem like an exclusive almost definitely will not stay that way for very long. Two, that a lot of these AI features aren't actually going to require you to buy the S24s, which is a good thing, but it's just purposefully not being made clear so you feel like you need to buy the new thing. And then three is the fine print, the little disclaimer that we all knew would pop up as soon as we found out that a lot of these AI features are relying on Samsung's online servers, that the online AI features are only going to be free until the end of 2025. I don't like it. Because, you know, the company comes on stage and they say, our new phone does this amazing thing. And like, these S24 phones, they're expensive. So naturally, most people are going to assume that price is your price of entry to use those features. That's how it's worked with every single phone up until this point. So having this hidden charge to use the headline feature you're launching your phone with doesn't sit well with me. And yes, Samsung is taking on extra cost from the servers they're going to have to use to host these AI requests. I get that, but then either don't release the feature till it can run without that, or don't sell it as a feature of the phone, because it's not then, it's a feature of your servers. And yes, they're saying the AI will be free till the end of 2025, but if anyone buys this phone now, then even if you're just on a short 24-month plan, you will still just enter the period where you will have to hand over your credit card details for what could well be yet another monthly subscription, on top of the monthly fees you're already paying for your data, on top of the price of the phone. Okay. I've had my moan. So final couple of things before we bring this all together. In case I didn't already make this clear, this is also the fastest Samsung I've ever used. But what happens when you push it? Well, I have recently come to the realization that the PlayStation 2 can finally be properly emulated on Android phones. And bear in mind, emulation is a very resource intensive task because it's not just that your phone has to run a game, it's actually that it has to use its power to simulate a completely different set of hardware that the game was originally designed to run on. But this thing can do it. This phone is powerful enough that I was plain sailing through my entire childhood library of PS2 games, including upscaling them to run in HD. And that is about as demanding a thing as you can ask a phone to do. Now, that in itself is kind of a sore spot too, because I do really want to start seeing phone companies not just dropping a load of big numbers in our lap and saying, here you go, have fun, but actually helping to create reasons for that power to exist. Like, I don't know, work with Rockstar to bring GTA 5 to the phone and show how your phone can run it. That would be exciting. But as for where this sits on the smartphone performance ladder, I would say top three phones in the market right now. If you pull up a synthetic stress test, you can see how the performance does not maintain its peak level. It does get hot and the performance does dip after prolonged stress. And this isn't negligible, I wouldn't write it off. To the people who are looking at getting the extra four or five frames per second when gaming for over an hour at a time, you will be able to tell the difference between this and a dedicated gaming phone. But me personally, I've only actually been able to see those thermal issues when using benchmarks. None of my normal use, my gaming use, or my emulator use has caused any noticeable dip at all. And the phone does that while lasting for ages. This is the best battery life ever in a Samsung flagship. The battery isn't bigger, they've just found ways to get more out of it. I want to slightly caveat that by saying I definitely with this phone notice a higher difference than normal between its high drain states and its low drain states. Like when I'm playing a big game, even for 30 minutes and I come out, I will have dropped 5 to 8%. I would guess because this chip has such a high performance ceiling that it can go to. But then equally when I'm browsing on YouTube and Instagram, the phone feels like it's going to last forever. And so what that means is the average for me is 8 to 9 hours of screen on time per charge. I'm reaching evenings with at least 25% left in the tank, but sometimes even 50, which is quite a lot more than I can say for my iPhone. So, with all of this in mind, at least until something big happens on the Apple end, the iPhone is now being relegated to a secondary phone, and this is the one that I'm going to be keeping my SIM in. Mostly because I think Samsung's fixed a lot of their longer running issues this time around. The software looks great, it feels great, the camera feels smooth, and in fixing the fundamentals, it also gives you the space to appreciate the extras. The gorgeous anti-reflective screen, the updated materials and the in-hand feel, and the AI features, a lot of which actually do make it feel like I am holding something next generation. Although, what isn't clear at this point is how much of the stuff that I've loved about using this phone will also apply to last generation Samsungs, when they too also inevitably 
probably get the latest software update. Like if they get a lot of the same AI features and the same level of polish and efficiency, then the need to spring for the absolute latest is drastically diminished. So I would say if you're on an S23 right now, hang on to find out. Now, you might have also noticed right there on my phone's home screen, the Surfshark VPN icon. There's a reason that with Surfshark, it's not just about having a VPN, this is your entire internet toolkit in one. Like for example, it can create you an alternative ID, an entire name, address, postal code, email address, and you can permanently have access to those details and copy them with a single click. It can change your GPS location as well as your internet location, which means let's say you're playing Pokemon Go and you want to catch a Pokemon that's on the other side of the planet, you can do that from your bedroom and save yourself $1,000 in flights. It has a kill switch, which means if you want to make sure that you're secure at all times, you can set Surfshark up to automatically cut the internet connection if the VPN connection ever drops. Not to mention servers that are specifically designed to wipe themselves every single time they're turned off. So none of your data is kept. So when you combine that with the fact that when you use the code BOSS, it's less than $3 a month for an unlimited number of accounts with an extra six months for free and a 30-day money-back guarantee, it's a bit of a no-brainer.